from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all. I'm your host, Jason Arkles. And once again, welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for sculptors working in the figurative tradition. A podcast lovingly handcrafted in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today, well, we have some current events issues to discuss, don't we? By now, most of you have heard the big news of this week, that in a press release on February 2nd, 2015, which was just last Monday, researchers and historians claim that new evidence proves that two bronze statuettes in the UK are by none other than the hand of Michelangelo Buonarroti. Now, these two statuettes, showing two ideal male nudes astride two panthers, have been known since the 19th century, and former owners have even asserted that they were by Michelangelo, although critics and historians have mostly agreed that they are either products of the school of Michelangelo or maybe the school of Benvenuto Cellini, the mannerist devotee of Michelangelo. But now, researchers at Cambridge University in the UK are convinced that they have found a smoking gun of sorts, proving that these were, in fact, by Michelangelo. The evidence comes in the form of a sketch made by an apprentice of Michelangelo dated to 1508. Now, this sketch was apparently made after a drawing by Michelangelo himself, and it's of a, a man astride a panther in a similar composition to the bronzes. Now, according to news reports and press releases, the current owner of the bronzes, who remains anonymous, approached an art history professor at Cambridge, a professor Paul Joannidis. And Professor Joannidis remembered seeing a drawing very similar to these bronzes in a museum in France. Spurred on by this connection, Joannidis started collating evidence and making comparisons of these bronzes to known Michelangelo sculptures and drawings. Some analytical tests were made, and these tests, according to the researchers, date the bronzes to the first decade of the 16th century, which would put them right after Michelangelo finished the David and before the start of the work on the Sistine ceiling in Rome. Further, the news articles state that a clinical anatomist was brought in from Warwick University, a professor Peter Abrahams, who is convinced that these works are by Michelangelo. Quoting Abrahams, he says, there was no one in the early 1500s who had such detailed anatomical knowledge and modeling skills to make such near-perfect muscular men. He goes on to say, as the only clinical anatomist and medical scientist in a team of some of the world's most experienced Renaissance art historians and sculpture experts, it has been an amazing and exciting month of frenzied research which will culminate in an international conference this summer. Unquote. These bronzes are now on view at the Fitzwilliams Museum, which is in Cambridge, and a Dr. Victoria Avery, a representative of the museum and an art historian there, says, quote, The bronzes are exceptionally powerful and compelling works of art that deserve close-up study. We hope the public will come and examine them for themselves and engage with this ongoing debate. She goes on to say, They are clearly masterpieces. The modeling is superb. They are so powerful and so compelling, so whoever made them had to have been superb. Avery also mentions the caution with which the researchers proceeded with the work. Quote, You have to be pretty brave to even contemplate that they could be work by an artist of the magnificence and fame and importance of Michelangelo. We decided to be rather cautious, to be very careful and methodical. Nobody wants to be shot down and to look like an idiot. The Fitzwilliam Museum has also printed a short book detailing the discovery and the evidence. Victoria Avery states, I really hope people will engage with this, that they will read the arguments, maybe sit down in a cafe for a half an hour with the book, and then come and look at the bronzes and make their own mind up. Well, so there you go. If you want to see these bronzes for yourself, the exhibition will be at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge from now until the 9th of August, 2015. So, this is big news. I mean, this isn't just big news of the week or of the month. I mean, these bronzes, if the researchers are correct with their attribution, 
would be the discovery of the decade. I mean, it would be like time to rewrite the history books sort of big. Michelangelo was certainly known to have created bronzes, but until now, none were known to survive. We could only guess as to how the divine Michelangelo modeled his work through a few preparatory sketches which have survived the years. But now it seems we have the real deal, the thing itself, bronze statuary from the hand of Michelangelo. So, is this a 100% ironclad, done deal sort of thing? Or are there doubts to be raised about such a momentous, slam-dunk discovery happening out of the blue like this? Well, the last thing I want to do is to uh, shoot my mouth off about things I don't know enough about. Uh, if the experts say they are by Michelangelo, then who am I to dissent from that opinion? I've only read the news articles and have seen a few pictures of the work on the internet. I am in no place to give my opinion as to the authenticity of the work. I certainly can agree with the idea that if these statuettes were made in 1508, as they say, Almost no one alive but Michelangelo could have authored them. The anatomical know-how exhibited in these works, elements of the composition, and actually, for me personally, the, the manner in which the hair on the head is treated, it all seems very much like the hand of Michelangelo. In 1508, Michelangelo, he, he isn't as big as he would get later. I mean, he was still just a great sculptor, but not the leader of a new period of art, which would become to known as mannerism. So if mannerism wasn't yet a thing in 1508, no one is going to be producing work in the manner of Michelangelo, except Michelangelo himself. However, I won't go as far to say that I have doubts, but I will say that I have questions. I actually have a lot of questions. Again, I don't want to stick my foot into this too much. Uh, I've ordered the, the booklet that the Fitzwilliam has printed about this uh, discovery. Uh, and it gives the complete story. And I was hoping to get the booklet in time for the recording of this podcast, but it still hasn't arrived. So I'm hoping and assuming that this book will answer some of my many, many, many questions that I, that I have about this attribution. And when it does arrive, I will duly make my report to you in another episode if my questions get answered. Okay, so even though I don't have the little booklet yet, just yesterday, this Friday, February 6th, the Fitzwilliam Museum released an hour-long, two-part YouTube video called Dr. Victoria Avery, A Michelangelo Discovery, A Lunchtime Talk. I was very excited about this, and I was hoping that this hour-long, two-part presentation would, would clarify things and provide evidence and conclusions not covered in the, uh, the news reports. And it did clarify a few points, mostly just filling in some of the vaguer bits, but the newspapers have all the major points correct. There was no additional compelling evidence brought to light. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the presentation and the book that I've ordered will be very similar in terms of content. So watch the YouTube video for yourself if you want the information that I'm covering here, if you want to get it you know, firsthand from the Fitzwilliam Museum. Again, it's on YouTube and it's called Dr. Victoria Avery, A Michelangelo Discovery. And I suspect that uh, many of you might have questions of your own and probably tons of questions that haven't occurred to me. So if you do, please go to the Facebook page and uh, send me any comments or concerns or, or criticisms or questions about these bronzes and about what the researchers and the museum are saying about them. I'll try to answer them as I find out more about the attributions and the methods and practices of the researchers and the conclusions they've reached. So let's get down to some of the questions I have. All right. When I first read these articles, oh, and, and by the way, special thanks to two listeners, Haley and Ruth, both of whom tipped me off to the breaking news at the same time. Um, anyway, so when I, when I first read these articles, it all seemed fairly cut and dry, right? I mean, you got these two bronzes, which had been suspected of possibly being by Michelangelo in the past, and they were matched to a drawing produced in 1508, made by an apprentice of Michelangelo's. And this led to scientific analysis of the bronzes via something called a neutron scan, which, according to the articles, positively dates the bronzes to the first decade of the 16th century. This, combined with possibly related figure studies which survive, they all sort of paint a picture convincing enough to definitively declare that these works are of Michelangelo. 
And on top of all of this, it's difficult to find a plausible alternative sculptor who could have produced in 1508 works of such anatomical accuracy and such a Michelangelo-esque style. So first, I accept all these assertions at face value, for lack of any conflicting information or special knowledge of the topic. But the first thing that I wanted to know about more was about this drawing that started the whole thing, you know, this, this smoking gun, the drawing of Michelangelo's statues, a drawing now located in the Musée Fabre in France, apparently done by an apprentice in a known time and place. At least, that's what's claimed. But in reality, what we know about this drawing is a lot more fuzzy than the articles and press releases make it out to be. First off, the drawing is by whom? An apprentice, says all the press releases. Well, which apprentice? Actually, we don't have his name. All we have is a sheet of paper, which has several drawings and sketches on it, some of which are copies of Michelangelo's known sketches, and some are not. Now, in those days, it was absolutely common practice for apprentices to learn from their master by copying the master's drawings. I mean, it's, it's how Michelangelo learned to draw, right? He copied drawing after drawing of his master, Domenico Ghirlandaio. Drawings were also commonly passed between studios, loaned out, altered and improved upon, and so forth. So drawings were like useful tools, and these tools were shared among artists. So it's no stretch to think that a sheet of paper containing several sketches, some of which can be directly linked to known Michelangelo sketches, are in fact copies made by a student of some sort. We don't know who. There's a sketch of a Virgin Mary embracing the infant Jesus on this page, and out of the half dozen or so sketches on the page, it's uh, this one, the Virgin Mary, that is really sort of fully fleshed out with shading and can be directly linked to a work by the hand of Michelangelo. Uh, the remaining five sketches on this same sheet of paper are simple, very, very simple outline sketches, almost, almost doodles, really, much less studied and rendered than the sketch of the Virgin embracing the infant Jesus. One of these doodles is of a man astride a panther. But if this particular sketch is a copy from a design made by Michelangelo, the original from which it was made no longer exists. So we have this copy, if it's a copy, but we don't have the original sketch. Now this page filled with sketches has been identified apparently as having been made in 1508. I can find no information in the news articles or in the YouTube presentation as to how this was determined. I'm really hoping that the book printed by the Fitzwilliam Museum can shed some light on the dating of this paper. But for now, we'll take it as fact. We'll take it as truth that the page was drawn from start to finish in 1508. But if that is a fact, that is where the facts end in this story. And the rest seems left to conjecture and assumption. Now, the first assumption is that the sketch of the man riding the panther is a copy of a drawing made by Michelangelo. This is an assumption made by the Cambridge art historian based only on the fact that other sketches on the same page are from Michelangelo drawings. There's a huge difference in the way the Virgin embracing the infant Jesus is worked out and modeled and finished and rendered as opposed to all these other little doodles. Go to the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and take a look for yourself at this page of drawing. I've got it up on the image gallery. You will see that where one drawing is obviously rendered carefully and from some sort of source drawing, the others are sketches that may or may not be from a similar source. So it's, it's somewhat of a leap to assume that because one drawing was made after a Michelangelo drawing, that all others on the same page were made from the same sort of sources and at the same time. If they are, those drawings no longer exist. And without this corroborating evidence, we will never know for sure. That is, we will never know for sure unless you are Dr. Victoria Avery of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. In the YouTube presentation, she makes an astounding statement. You can, you can watch her say it yourself, but I'll give you the exact quote. Dr. Avery says of these drawings, We believe they are absolutely accurate copies of lost works by Michelangelo. Unquote. Now, how can anyone make that claim if you've never seen the originals and you don't even know who the copyist is? How can you believe that the copies are absolutely accurate? What could possibly lead you to make this claim? 
I mean, am I wrong or did this art historian just sort of blow her credibility here? Again, the quote, we believe they are absolutely accurate copies of Lost Works by Michelangelo. I, 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 don't, I don't see how you can support that kind of statement. But let's give the art historians from Cambridge the benefit of the doubt, right? Which, of course, we should. We should give them the benefit of the doubt. These guys are sticking their neck out for this attribution. We have to assume they really did the homework for something like this. So, let's assume the sketch of a man riding a panther was done from a drawing Michelangelo made. How does this prove that Michelangelo followed through and sculpted a man riding a panther in bronze? Well, the short answer is we don't. With the evidence presented, it can only ever be an assumption. But listen to what art historian Paul Joannidis says in the book that I'm currently waiting for. I have been able to find a few quotes in different articles on the internet, and this one is, uh, is kind of pertinent. Professor Joannidis says, quote, Although the concetto of the muscular nude riding the panther on the Musée Fabre sheet is quite small and apparently of no great significance, it is nevertheless a vital piece of evidence in the story of the Rothschild attribution, for it certainly records a lost drawing by Michelangelo. In so doing, it proves incontrovertibly two things. First, that Michelangelo was actively engaged with the very unusual subject of muscular men riding panthers. Second, he was doing so in the first eight years of the 16th century. Unquote. Now, I have to say, this, this kind of really irritates me. A responsible art historian should not say all the things he's saying. To say that this sketch certainly records a lost drawing by Michelangelo is false. It is an unprovable assumption. And then, based on this unprovable assumption, he goes on to say that it proves incontrovertibly, that's his word, incontrovertibly, Michelangelo's interest in the subject of man on panther action, and that he is interested in the first years of the 16th century. I think that Professor Paul Joannidis and I have differing opinions on what is considered incontrovertible proof. He sets his bar fairly low, in my opinion, and I mean, yes, there is tantalizing evidence that this could be a design by the hand of Michelangelo, but to transform that somehow into proof beyond doubt? And even given all these assumptions, where is the evidence that Michelangelo turned his drawings into actual sculptures, and at virtually the same time this anonymous purported copy of this purported sketch was made? I don't know, it just all seems kind of shoddy. Assumptions based on assumptions presented, in his words, as incontrovertible fact. Don't make an assumption and then present extrapolations from that assumption as, as proof. Just show me proof. And I see none here. But again, as I said, I do not doubt the opinions of professional art historians. I know my place. I am but a lowly practitioner of the craft. I'm not an academic. I'm not a real art historian. I'm only an avid amateur. Who am I to doubt? But I do have questions. I hope to have my questions answered eventually. Another question I have, uh, let's assume, let's assume that the sketch was of a Michelangelo drawing and that Michelangelo indeed took that idea further than a drawing and rendered it into bronze. After all, for me, it, it's still quite plausible that these works are indeed by Michelangelo, given the date of execution of somewhere between 1506 and 1508. As I mentioned, I agree with the notion that at that time, there was no one else capable of sculpting these works. My question is, why is the assumption made that because the sketch was done in 1508, the sculptures were already underway or, or imminent? What reason do we have to assume the bronzes also date from that period? Well, that's where science comes in. Remember, the, the bronzes underwent a neutron scan. Now, lots of news sources were very vague about what this was. Some called the scan x-rays. Some called it a neutron scan. For instance, the article in the Daily Mail merely says, quote, Using X-ray, the team dated the works to the early 16th century. Another source states, quote, Research included a neutron scan at a research institute in Switzerland, which placed the bronzes in the first decade of the 16th century, unquote. Well, that sounds very impressive, but just what is going on? I mean, how does an X-ray or a neutron scan, whatever that is, how do, how do those date a sculpture to within a decade? 
Well, I did an extensive search for neutron scans and and what I found uh, is that basically it's like an upgraded version of an x-ray. It's just more powerful uh, and more nuanced and it's in common use uh, in the inspection of shipping containers at ports by customs officials. Now, I could find no reference though, no reference whatsoever to the use of neutron scans to date materials. And finally, I found in an article in The Economist um, which shed a little light on this situation, and I'll quote that. Quote, Conservation scientists from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam have determined with neutron X-ray imaging that the casts are thick-walled and heavy, which would date them to the late 15th or early 16th century. Okay, so that's the quote. And uh, and in the YouTube presentation, which I saw, um, it it repeats that information as well. So, the utility of this neutron scan, as high-tech as it sounds, only reveals how thick the bronzes are. Now, are we to understand that bronze casting is so well documented from those years that the wall thickness of a bronze from that general period can be used to pinpoint in time down to within a decade when the bronze was poured, based solely on the thickness of the bronze? Another article mentions that there are no signatures or foundry marks on these bronzes, so we don't have any idea who cast them. Now, if we don't know who the founders were, how would we know what their methods tended to be? Even today, the thickness of a bronze statue is going to come down, to a certain extent, to the personal preferences of the founder, or maybe even the skill and experience of whoever is working up the waxes for the bronze pour. Wall thickness can be especially variable on small-scale bronzes. And assuming these pieces were only cast once each, I would think that the tendency would be to err on the side of it being just a little thick to ensure a complete pour without blockages and voids. But the information in these articles, it tries to make us believe that the thickness of the bronzes of the first decade of the 16th century were distinct from any other time before or after. This hardly seems like a plausible notion that, say, after 1510, bronzes everywhere in Rome and Florence were thinner or different in some way than, than the works done just a few years previously. If a clear correlation exists, what is that correlation? You know, what is the data set that they are using in this comparison? I mean, is there a clear rule about the thicknesses of bronzes, which is already known to researchers and historians, that allows this determination to be made? I mean, this is the kind of thing you would expect to read in the articles and explained in the presentation. But the article just says that the bronzes are thick-walled. It doesn't give any information on what this actually signifies. So the article in The Guardian, which says the scan places the bronzes in the first decade of the 16th century, turns out to be, at the very least, speculative. It's one more assumption to add to the list. It seems that to prove something in the court of opinion of art history is a much easier thing to do than, say, in a court of law. If these bronzes were on trial for the crime of being made by Michelangelo, the case would be thrown out for lack of evidence. Now, all these ill-supported arguments brings up another question I have. Why the fixation on the attribution date of 1508, or at least from 1506 to 1510? You know, so the neutron scan purports to date the bronzes to this time. So what? Why is that important? Well, it seems there are several likely explanations the researchers would want 1508 to be the date of these bronzes. For one thing, it would seem more plausible that Michelangelo had the time in his early days in Rome to do a commission such as this. And what's more, it's more plausible he would have taken on a commission of this relatively modest scale earlier on rather than later in his career. And probably more relevantly, Michelangelo is known to have been working on at least two other bronze commissions during this decade. He did a reduction in bronze of his David and a colossal statue of Pope Julius II, also in bronze, both of which are now lost. Michelangelo never really finished any large sculpture past his 30s. He was just too busy. He was too in demand and too much of a perfectionist to see much of his work through to the end. Now, what are the chances that once he was in demand like that, that the two works that he would have finished are these small, unknown bronzes for an unknown client rather than his papal tombs or his princely tombs? The most logical time frame would have been 
before he was neck deep in the tomb of Pope Julius and in the Sistine ceiling. And so 1508 is just about the latest plausible date. And of course, there's the most compelling reason the researchers would want to have a 1508 attribution. If it could be proved beyond doubt that these were done in 1508, then, as I've said, they are most certainly by Michelangelo. No one else is even a, a close second for a candidate with the skill sets and talents for a pair of bronzes like these in 1508. And so my guess is that instead of pursuing the very difficult task of directly proving the bronzes were done by Michelangelo, the researchers set about proving that they were done in 1508, which would then strongly suggest that they were done by Michelangelo. If the works were known to be done in, say, 1538, then the chances they were done by someone in the Mannerist school goes way up, as the anatomical knowledge and modeling skill was more common by then, and the chances that they were made by Michelangelo goes way down, as he was presumably too busy for such relative trinkets. Now, I don't know too much about how art historians operate, but I do know that in many fields of study, this attribution to the first decade of the 16th century by these researchers would be regarded as a classic case of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. I'll read you the, the Wikipedia definition. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, or recall information in a way that confirms one's beliefs or hypotheses. It is a type of cognitive bias and a systematic error of inductive reasoning. People display this bias when they gather or remember information selectively, or when they interpret it in a biased way. People also tend to interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting their existing position. And to me, this sounds very close to how this team of researchers has operated. They need these bronzes to be dated to 1508 to make their claims stick. And so they've found ambiguous evidence in the form of the wall thickness of the bronze, and they have interpreted that as supportive of their claim, when in fact it does not support it at all. It only admits of the possibility of the claim. But you can't think of something as supportive evidence just because it doesn't rule out the possibility of your hypothesis. So where do all these questions lead me? Inevitably, I have to ask the question, why? Why such a shaky claim is being presented in the first place? Who stands to gain from sticking their neck out so rashly and in such a public way? Well, let's take a look first at the owner of these bronzes, whose name is, oh, that's right, he's anonymous. Well, this anonymous person, or perhaps entity or institution or business, who knows, uh, Mr. Anonymous here bought these bronzes in 2002 for a little under two million pounds, and they've been part of a few exhibitions since then, most recently in the 2012 London exhibition of bronzes at the Royal Academy of Art, when they were exhibited as being attributed to the circle of Michelangelo. Now, two million pounds is a lot of money, but how much do you think these bronzes would be worth if it was generally conceded they were by Michelangelo? 200 million? Maybe. Probably more. So obviously the owner would love to have these attributed to Michelangelo. I mean, come on, who wouldn't, right? But I also question why the owner is anonymous. I mean, there really could be any number of reasons, but one reason that keeps popping into my mind is that perhaps the identity of the owner would get in the way of the attribution. Now, we have no way of knowing whether this owner of the bronzes is simply a wealthy but retiring connoisseur who wishes to remain anonymous, or is someone who has a more complicated background. Perhaps this person has made a lot of money in the past by buying unattributed work and then hyping it as made by a famous creator and then selling it for a major profit to someone who believes in the hype. And that happens all the time. Art is worth what people are willing to pay for it. And some people are very good at getting people to pay a lot. And that's what a good gallerist does. And so if the owner has a history of this, the attribution might be met with even more skepticism than it already is. Of course, we have no way of knowing, and we shouldn't assume anything about the motives of the owner, but the anonymity of the owner does not help 
to dispel these possibilities. Now let's look at the current uh, sort of media spectacle underway. Now since the time of the London Exhibition, from 2012 to now, a space of about two and a half years, the following events have occurred according to all the news sources I can find. First, the, the anonymous British owner approached the Cambridge art historian Paul Joannidis uh, for help in attribution. Joannidis remembered this sketch he once saw in France, and that got the ball rolling. So in the space of less than a thousand days, a research team has been assembled, discoveries made, conclusions drawn, a book written and published, an exhibition with the Fitzwilliam organized, and finally, the big announcement made in a media blitz on the day before the exhibition opening for a six-month run. All of that in less than a thousand days. Now, that seems to me like a very short span of time for all this to happen sequentially rather than having been the plan from the beginning. Now, I'm not making the accusation of collusion between the owner and the museum, but it must be acknowledged that the Fitzwilliam stands to have a very good summer, what with the book sales and the ticket sales. And it's also great advance press for the Fitzwilliam's bicentennial celebrations and events next year in 2016. And if the attribution to Michelangelo is ultimately shot down, that probably won't really happen for several months, as the Fitzwilliam plans to hold a conference on the bronzes in July, towards the end of the exhibition, where it promises that more findings and research will be presented. So the longer the museum can hold back what they claim might be further evidence, the more reluctant others will be to publicly debunk those claims before then, and the more tickets the museum can sell. So, at the end of the day, yeah, I am a thoroughly jaded skeptic who attributes the worst motives to all involved. And I may well be proven wrong, as I have not even read the book the researchers have written in support of their claims. So, I am guilty of half-hearted investigative journalism. And if my own speculations are proven wrong in any detail, you can expect an immediate retraction and apology made by me. But there is one thing I am not skeptical about. The bronzes themselves. Even though I've been ranting for the last half hour about everything connected to this attribution, I still think the bronzes are pretty noteworthy, especially if they are from such a date. I mean, it's, it's, it's worth asking the question whether or not they are made by the hand of Michelangelo. It would not shock me, in fact, if they were. But show me the evidence. It only shocks me that the field of art history has let me down this much that such breathless and hasty claims built on virtually no positive evidence is taken so seriously. To me, it's indicative of the persuasive influence of money in the arts these days in every sector, and also indicative of the need to create a spectacle in order to attract the attention of the general public. Art historians and arts institutions that would fiddle with the legacy of Michelangelo in this way so casually and so hastily cannot, in my view, be thought of as serious. Well, I sure stuck my foot in it this time. So if you agree or disagree or, or have an additional point of view, air it out over at the Facebook page for the Sculptor's Funeral, and we shall engage in some respectful conversation. And if you are in or near Cambridge and have seen these bronzes or have read the book that I'm still waiting for, share what you know and what you think. Don't forget, you can subscribe to The Sculptor's Funeral on iTunes and Stitcher, and, and when you're there, don't forget to rate us and leave a review of the podcast. Also, check out the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, for a complete archive of the show that you can stream for free. Check out our podcast sponsor, Blick Art Supplies, by clicking on any of the Blick links you find at thesculptorsfuneral.com, and doing so will help to support the podcast. Thanks again for listening, as always. Thank you.